Welcome to the third episode of the Scoliosis Dialogues and SRS podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Karimana Blanc-Genevois from uh, France in uh, Lyon, Centre des Massus. I'm an active member since this year of uh, our society, and I'm very pleased to be with Ryan Fitzgerald for this uh, new episode of the Scoliosis Dialogues. I'm Dr. Ryan Fitzgerald from Riley Children's Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, also a member of the SRS. And we're excited today because we have an excellent lineup of uh, surgeons to talk with our membership. This is a continuation of our series of the highlights of the SRS 2020 virtual meeting. First, we will be meeting with the new president, Dr. Muharrem Yazici from Hachitepa University in Ankara, Turkey. All right, so today we have the honor and pleasure of interviewing Dr. Muharram Yazici, the current SRS president for the 2020-2021 year. He is at Hacettepa University in Ankara, Turkey, um, and he joins us today. So thank you so much, Dr. Yazici, for joining us and taking time to speak to me and to our, the membership of the SRS. Um, part of what we're trying to do through this podcast is get our membership to know the presidential line as well as the people that are on the podium. So starting out, just talking a little bit about you, you've had quite the illustrious clinical and academic career. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your SRS journey and how you got to the point of becoming the 2020 and 21 president. Thanks, Ryan and Karim. Um, I'm so honored to, uh, to be here today. I'm so proud to be having me in this uh, the podcast program. It's very excited. I may have heard the word of SRS maybe many years ago, but I understood the meaning of SRS the year I spent in Kansas City, Kansas. The late Mark Asher, God keeps him in the most prestigious place in the heaven, was a passionate fan of SRS. He was a board member back then, if I'm not mistaken. Then he became president. I don't even remember a day when the SRS wasn't referenced. He kept his previous, all the previous abstract books of uh, the SRS in a private shell in his office. I remember reading most of the old abstracts in my free time during fellowship. I was delighted when one of my fellowship, uh, the studies research was accepted to the podium. I met the first SRS podium at Asheville in 1995. I fell in love and this love got stronger each and every day. In 1996, I was accepted into the family as a corresponding member. Active membership was not possible for all US at that time. The first four or five years passed by getting to the, the now the organization. Actually, I started to climb the stairs gradually from the beginning of 2000. In 2002, I had a chance to visit nine prominent US Spine Center as a traveling fellow. We were the second international fellow group in SRS history. Beyond academic achievements, this program has made a huge contribution to my career in terms of networking. In those years, SRS was directing some of its young members to a program at the Kellogg Institute to develop the leadership skills. I have been one of the lucky ones who took this course sponsored by SRS. Then the committee work started. I first became a member of Growing Spine Committee. For a short time, I chaired this committee. As far as I remember, uh, I was the second member to be the OUS committee chair. This is such a great honor to me. After the mid 2000s, the globalization effort mainly uh, started with the Larry Lenke of SRS increase. The strategic planning meetings were held. Being invited to the first two or three of these meetings to represent all US members. First, corresponding members were converted to the active membership 
And with this change, all U.S. members were open to the leadership positions. All U.S. members began to be represented on the board. If my memory doesn't fool me, Mr. Edgar from UK was a pioneer in this field. Then Azmi from Turkey, Paco from Spain, Ten from Hong Kong became board of directors and I followed them. I was a member of program committee for three separate terms and as the first OUS chairman of this committee, I strived for the success of the Philly Congress. Later, I was elected to BL and today's president. Sorry for telling the story a little too long, but I guess it was necessary to emphasize that this journey lasted almost 25 years. To emphasize that, I came by taking the steps to get to present position and spending the necessity time on each. Last but not least, I would like to share a very important note. In last 25 years, 25 of my words, works were accepted on, for podium, five of them in Tips Award session. Unfortunately, I haven't received this award so far, but I hope one day. There's still time. <laughs> Well, I think that was a great story about not only your path through the SRS, but also about how the SRS has developed over the years and taken a more international uh, view. So I think that's wonderful. As a part of this too, we want to get to know you as, as the man a bit as well. So can you share with us something interesting that maybe we can't find online or by reading your CV? Yeah, but I'd like to answer this question related to my CV again. I think this will, will be more interesting, especially for our young listeners. I have now contributed over 150 peer-reviewed articles to date. More than 90% of them are spine, and the vast majority of them are about pediatric spine deformity. As first glance at my CV, you can get the impression that I work on many different areas of spine deformity field. But if you look carefully, you can understand that I've been following certain research questions for years, and I've been a persistent follower of some basic questions determined over the years. Most of my works complement each other, aiming to go one step further than the previous study left off. This is a preference, and I care very much about it. I think it's a better approach to focus on sequential work towards a specific goal rather than doing a lot of research. That's great. I think that that's good uh, advice for anyone that's trying to push research forward. So each year it seems that the president of the SRS has quite a few time commitments and projects that are on their agenda for the year, but Typically, there's one larger push or one larger focus. Um, and one thing that caught my eye, and this may or may not be a larger focus of yours, but it, it caught my eye uh, a couple years ago. It sounded like starting back in February of two, 2019, you started the SRS I Experience project. I purchased this project and, and started working through it to see um, everything that's been put together. And it really is a a great way to work through early onset scoliosis. Um, but I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about this project and what our membership can glean from it. Indeed, it's a great project. It's, it's very important for me. But first of all, I need to clarify one point. This project I experienced, later on be called as I experienced, was first brought up and implemented by Peter. Paul gave unlimited support to the project. It's my debt to remember these two visionary leaders to give them the credit they definitely deserve. For me, it's both an honor and extraordinary chance or privilege to follow in the footsteps of Peter and Paul. This is a huge project, both in terms of time needed, workloads, and financial support. The SRS leadership gave me the honor of leading EOS 
selected as pilot module. We managed to complete uh, the first module, albeit a li little bit longer than planned, with an extra exceptionally knowledgeable and passionate editorial team. Uh, Laurel Blackmore, Laurel Saver, Ying Lee, Samit Kark, and Bryce Ilharawat. Finally, a product that satisfies all of us. We received very encouraging feedback in a short time. A great team started working for the second module, spondylolysthesis. We learned a lot from the first module. I hope we will work faster and more effectively. We are planning to complete nine core curriculum domains step by step. Now is in the spondylolysthesis, probably the next one is going to be full adult topic and the next one is following after this. But I experience it's a big project, as I said before, but it's actually part of a larger project, SRS Blended Learning Platform. In this platform, there will be a structured in-person meeting or course, cadaver courses, surgeon visitation programs, etc., as well as online training modules such I experience. I personally have a big dream one day to create an SRS e-fellowship program. I know this is not an easy task. It's very difficult, a project like no other. But the world definitely needs this, especially surgeons with limited resources outside the Western world. It should be normal for me to prioritize this as a second OUS president, because I'm re representing outside of the US and I personally prioritize their needs. This is the, my dream. That's great. Where can our members go to enroll or find out more about the SRSI experience? Our AOS module is currently available to all surgeons, whether they are SRS members or not. They can easily access this module through our website. There is an icon in the right top as I experience. The other modules will be added as they are prepared. Of course, it will take time, but in one day, we are hoping to complete our care curriculum under the I experience. Fantastic. Thanks so much for sharing about that project. I think it's really exciting. And like you said, it's a large work, but the quality that's been put out so far is really exciting. I think it has a bright future. Do you have any tips for our young surgeons that are starting their deformity careers in um, maybe patient care or in getting more involved? Definitely. I would like to repeat in the same words as I'm telling to my fellows and the residents every day. Working hard may not guarantee any success. Although you work hard, you may not be able to achieve all you want, but it is not possible to get anything without hard working. First of all, I recommend that they work hard. Even they are not working in, a, in an academic environment, I recommend that they try to be part of a research, albeit on a modest level. Networking being a part of scientific world also enriches people. It opens new doors to people and expands their horizons. Please let them take this advice seriously. Hardworking, research-oriented thinking, and networking. That's my message. Do you have any closing remarks for our, uh, for our listeners today, Dr. Yuzichi? Yes, I'm a colleague from an institute outside of the developed Western world, which doesn't have a serious research tradition. I'm not a branch of a well-known genealogy tree. If I could reach this point by climbing these steps, you can definitely do better. I wholeheartedly believe this. No need to be shy or timid. Work, passion, perseverance, that's all. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time today. Uh, we look forward to the next year with the SRS and you at our home. 
Yeah, hopefully we will meet in person in St. Louis. God knows. Absolutely. Look forward to seeing you there. <laughs> we really wish you to be on the podium, yeah. Muharrem. Yeah, because it's it's not the same on the screen, honestly. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we would yeah. really appreciate to see you. Me too. Great interview. Bravo. Thank you very much, Dr. Yazici. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. It's my pleasure today uh, and privilege to in interview uh, Dr. Sukinsha, pediatric orthopedic surgeon uh, who is division chief of the Spine and Scoliosis Center at Nemours Dupont Hospital for Children in Wilmington, USA. Sukin, thank you very much for being here today and congratulations for those uh, two award-winning papers that you presented at the annual meeting uh, of SRS this year. They were great papers. Could you please summarize a little bit the relevance of your research uh, the first one was uh, complications following posterior surgi surgical treatment of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, uh, who uh, win the HIPS Clinical Science uh, Research Award. Well, thanks very much, Carrie. And um, it was um, it was a, definitely an amazing award, a very humbling honor. But I do have to acknowledge that uh, both studies, in fact, were done by really dedicated study groups. And we have to take our hats off to our research coordinators and obviously all the patients who participate in these longitudinal studies and registries so that we can learn as a society uh, what's the best way to recommend treatment. But um, I, I, think, I think the first project, which uh, revolved around studying long-term complications and reoperations in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis patients, uh, can basically be summarized by very robust data on 284 patients followed a minimum of 10 years showed that our complication rate for major complications that we previously described was about 12% over that period. And the rate of reoperation was about 6% over that 10 year period. Uh, and what we found was several distinct uh, interesting issues. With posterior spinal fusion with instrumentation, early complications centered around infection or SSI. The late long-term uh, uh, complications centered around adding on and pseudarthrosis. And interestingly, many complications showed up well after two and five years. So um, the other recommendation we would make is that these patients do need to follow, be followed for a long time because complications can show up later. Just because they're doing well at two years is not the end of the story. Sukin, uh, how would you advise young surgeons starting their practice to keep their data? Because you're talking about registries, but we know how important these data are in our, in our practice, in our patient counseling. So how to make it something in our routine today? Well, uh, you bring up a great point because what you're basically asking about is a self-audit. Uh, you can do that informally through your own practice uh, with your own staff. Uh, you can do that formally by participating in a registry or even something like the Surgeon Performance Program where we need to be better, but the only way to be better is to study what we did in the past, make iterative improvements, and then restudy that. Uh, so there are various venues, uh, some through industry, some through your society, but I would recommend that all young surgeons participate in some sort of registry for practice improvement. And that's at least the United States becoming a requirement for board certification and uh, certain surveys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you're perfectly right. So uh, concerning the results of your, your study with the HOM study group, uh, how are your results gonna impact your patient counseling today with these complications that you have seen 10 years after? Do you think that the latest technologies and knowledge about uh, ideal spinal shape will have an influence on the, on the next 10 years results? Or do you think that we have to, to tell the truth to our patients? Well, I think this arms us with information to, in fact, be very accurate. Many surgeons may have been citing their own figures or the m, &M database, and uh, we do need to be, in this current shared decision-making model, be very honest with our patients, as you mentioned. I think technology will help us, but I think armed with this knowledge, now we have opportunity to be better. Uh, we're constantly trying to reduce our infection rate. We're constantly trying to reduce the pseudarthrosis uh, rate. Uh, I think the add-on issue can certainly be addressed by shape-specific uh, curve patterns and, and proper treatment. So I, I believe we get, we're getting better, and I'm an optimist that we're getting better, 
Uh, and posterior spinal fusion with instrumentation is still an excellent treatment for uh, severe deformity and will continue to be the gold standard, which all innovation will be judged against. Thank you. Uh, so now if we turn into the second paper, and again, congratulations for this award, uh, the Louis Goldstein Best Clinical Research Poster Award. Can you tell us more about uh, your idea on definitive fusions compared to growth-friendly procedures in this particular case of CP patients with scoliosis? Yes, thank you, Carrie. As we know, neuromuscular patients, specifically the cerebral palsy patients, are very difficult to manage when they have early onset scoliosis. Uh, the big controversy is, do we wait to fuse or do we instrument them with growing constructs, growth-friendly constructs to preserve growth and then convert them to final fusion? And it may not be so black and white. So we chose a very specific age group between eight and 10. Uh, the curves were similar. This was a collaboration between two study groups, the HARM study group and the pediatric spine study group, where we identified two cohorts of patients, juvenile patients who were treated with growth only constructs and juvenile patients who were definitively fused as a sort of one and done operation. And when we looked at the preoperative demographics, the groups were very similar for comparison. So I think that validates this study. When we looked at the postoperative outcomes um, at definitive fusion and two years after definitive fusion, we found that the single stage operation of posterior spinal fusion was better over the long term, lower complication rate, lower infection. And when looking at patient reported outcomes, or in this case, caregiver reported outcomes, the parents were much more satisfied with the single stage surgery rather than having the growth friendly alternative and then being converted to final fusion. So our, our conclusion was that when faced with a choice, it's better perhaps to do a definitive fusion. If you can delay the surgery a little bit until the triradiate cartilage is closed, you might have the best outcome that way. Would you then advocate for a longer bracing period or conservative treatment when you can to, to wait as long as possible to let them grow? Or do you think that these patients have so severe deformities that you you might even perform a, an early fusion compared to what we can do in AIS. Yes, well, that's, that's really where the, the fine details matter and risk stratification, uh, curve flexibility and skeletal assessment would probably be able to customize treatment in that scenario. So when the child has multiple uh, medical conditions that need to be managed along with the spinal deformity, we would advocate perhaps not waiting would be the best option. If the curve remains flexible, we would say that waiting perhaps would be the best option. So when curve magnitude and flexibility become more rigid and they're starting to deteriorate um, the other medical comorbidities of that patient, we would move ahead with, with posterior spinal fusion as a single stage. We believe much more in the prophylactic treatment rather than being reactive uh, in treatment in this scenario. Thank you. Very wise uh, suggestion. Last question, more personal question for you, Sukhan, today um, during the, this post-get session. Uh, how and when did you uh, start to interest yourself to spinal deformity? Uh, in other words, could you tell us about your early career and maybe about your mentors? Oh, sure. Well, I, I think recognizing our, our teachers and our mentors is very important. Um, I became interested in, in pediatric orthopedic surgery uh, at the beginning part of residency, not knowing which subspecialty I would ultimately evolve to. But uh, my spine mentors are uh, Todd Albert and Alex Vaccaro. Uh, they encouraged me to choose uh, spine as a career. Uh, I was also very um, influenced by Richard Bowen, Dean McEwen, and Will McKenzie, who certainly shaped the, the pediatric orthopedic part of my career. And since I had a strong spine residency training, uh, I, naturally it evolved in, into a blend of both. So I'm, I'm very grateful to all of them, uh, as well as my family for being very encouraging. And so Carrie, I also have to mention that uh, external mentorship is very important. Through the study group, Peter Newton, um, Randy Betts, and Paul Sponseller have been uh, luminaries to me and others on how to properly do research uh, and present that, those important questions. And the friends and mentors in the Scoliosis Research Society have, have also provided a lot of um, support and uh, excellent uh, friendships too. Great family indeed, people that are all around you. Yeah, yeah it's wonderful. Yeah. 
Can't do it alone, right? Yeah, that's true. Wonderful, amazing people that you met in, in your career and uh, now you're becoming one of, of those. So uh, thank you for your time. It, it was really a pleasure and honor to be with you today to discuss a little bit more about these papers that I think will make uh, a, a lot of impact on our decision making in, in everyday care of these pediatric deformities. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have the, the chance to discuss other topics uh, around these complications and crucial decision makings for these kids. Thank you very much, Sukhan. Okay, thank you, Carrie. So joining us today, we have Dr. Brandon Ramo uh, joining us from Texas Scottish Rite Hospital. He is an assistant professor also at UT Southwestern. So Brandon, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as a part of this podcast, one of the things that we're trying to do is to make it a little bit more personalized. A lot of times we see the leaders within the society, we see the authors on the podium, and we don't really get to know a lot about them outside of that. So part of it is just kind of getting to know each other. So tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about you kind of outside of medicine. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia. I've been in Dallas for nine of the last 10 years now, but I'm a Georgia guy at heart and a Georgia bulldog growing up. Let's see, I've got four kids. So my wife and I have a 13-year-old, a 10-year-old, and two seven-year-olds. So we kind of got four on accident or four for the price of four. And so we spend a lot of time kind of chasing after them and soccer games and swimming meets and things like that before COVID. Now it's you know, trips to the local fishing pond and uh, camping trips. But, you know, we kind of keep busy with our little ones. We're right in the thick of it right now. So we've been in Dallas for eight years now. That's great. Outside of family time, do you have any particular hobbies that you uh, spend time? Do you, do you run or do any, anything physically or? I think I'm one of those jack of all trade, master of none kind of guys. You know, I like uh, Georgia football on the weekends and I follow an English soccer team and I try to run and swim and do some light weights and things like that and take the boys to top golf every once in a while. And gosh, I don't know, I like craft beers and trying to smoke briskets because I live in Texas now. So I've got to try to smoke a brisket every once in a while. So I don't know, we, we kind of as a family dabble in a lot of little things. Great. And so how did you kind of end up at TSRH and so involved in the SRS and, and doing scoliosis? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I was a resident at Vanderbilt, and I had good exposure to spine surgeons early on. Uh, funny story was my very first orthopedic rotation at Wash U. I was assigned to, this, to one of the spine surgeons who got injured right before my rotation started. And so, like, last minute, the week before, they assigned me to Dr. Linky's service, uh, Larry Linky, who usually didn't have medical students. I think, you know, the complexity of what he was doing. Uh, even back then in 2004, it was kind of felt to be too much for medical students to go and spend time with. Uh, but I got to spend a month with him, uh, and he had some excellent fellows at the time who sort of took me under their wing. So uh, I've had these, these kind of lucky encounters with some really talented people. At Vanderbilt, I worked with Greg Mencio, who's a very talented uh, spine surgeon. And, uh, and then obviously when I matched at Scottish Rite, I, I was told by my Vanderbilt uh, faculty, you you've got to go there if you can. Uh, and there's just obviously a slew of, you know, very bright, uh, excellent spine surgeons as mentors there. So I think I kind of just fell into this scoliosis thing to some extent, a little bit on accident. But every time I would learn more, I would get more interested and felt like that was something I could do and contribute to. And, uh, you know, I think uh, academic medicine's fun. I like being a part of it and it's easy to do where I am now. So I don't know. I think I, I stumbled in, but I've been enjoying participating in the research and the academic part of it. I think that's really true. I think that our mentors really, really shape where we end up and having great ones. Obviously, you, uh, you've been in a lot of great places with a lot of great people. So thanks for sharing that. So the reason that we asked you to come on today was I felt like in watching the 2020 meeting that there were a few papers that stood out and one of them was yours. And I thought that yours uh, also brought some good thought and some good discussion towards scoliosis. And so this paper is AIS patients with pain catastrophizing have worse SRS scores one year postoperatively. And so the paper, I think, is kind of looking at the, the patient as a whole a little bit more, which we've been trying to do for quite a long time, but I think this just sheds even more light on it. And so you guys looked at 203 patients preoperatively and one year postoperatively. You looked at the pain catastrophizing score, the PCS, which that is a, um, a score that is validated 
as well as SRS 30s. And you found that people that scored more poorly on the pain catastrophizing score had worse uh, one-year post-op outcomes. So can you tell us a little bit more about that paper and, and your findings? Yeah, well, I think the origin of that paper is kind of interesting because it was really a, it's really a truly collaborative project with our psychology team. We're really lucky that we have a, um, several staff psychologists at Scottish Rite that we can work with. And I remember distinctly about six or seven years ago, we had a patient that really just kind of lost it on the floor postoperatively, just lost it, couldn't get pain controlled. And we sort of consulted psychology in this emergent fashion. What are we going to do with this kid? They're, they're, we have to sedate them or how are we going to manage their pain because it's, it's out of control. And the psychologist sort of said, hey, you know, guys, it would be a lot easier if you would call us before this happens than after. Uh, and so, you know, they kind of educated me on, you know, there are ways that we can measure pain and how people perceive pain. And it helps us if we can learn about these kids before surgery. So we started this little pilot project, my, you know, and they taught me about this pain catastrophizing scale, which is this validated measure that corresponds to long-term pain if uh, children demonstrate this pain catastrophizing. And so um, I had to convince my senior partners to let me give this to their patients. They were very nervous that if we asked them about pain before surgery, it was going to worsen their pain. And the psychologists, of course, they laughed at us and said, guys, it doesn't work that way. But we did a little pilot project of about 50 patients, and we sort of showed that we didn't make their pain worse by asking them about pain. And then my partners agreed. And so we started giving it to everybody, all of our AIS patients, and we do about 130, 140 AIS surgeries a year. And we started giving it to everyone. And then I kind of forgot about it for a few years uh, and let it just run, which was great because it was designed to be prospective and I wanted several years of patients. Uh, and then we, we last summer started pulling the data and looking at it. And sure enough, the kids that hit this threshold who considered catastrophizers, they, they think about their pain too much, they magnify their pain, they feel helpless. Uh, they were scoring far worse on their SRS 30 scores. Uh, and so, and that was not only preoperatively, they were worse preoperatively, but then they remained worse postoperatively. And so, you know, I think you and I as, as spine surgeons who are treating these patients, we want everybody to do well, but there's this percentage of patients because of the way they think about pain, we're sort of set up for a loss. You know, if we don't address that first, then we're going to have patients who are coming back to us with chronic pain. Uh, even if we've done a technically nice surgery and picked our levels well and gotten great correction, you know, there is a, a, a mental or a cognitive feature about the way they think about things that's going to kind of come back to haunt us as the surgeon, if you will. So and that's the gist of the paper, I think, is now we know how to identify these kids. And I think next steps are, can we help them? And so you found it was about 11% of patients scored above that 30, and that was kind of a, a bad score. And then you also found a cutoff that it correlated to with the SRS 30s. Is that right? Yeah. So that's what we wanted to be able to do uh, was, you know, one thing is we didn't want to have to keep giving 100% of all AIS patients this pain catastrophizing scale. It's only 13 questions, but it's, it's a lot of work to initiate that uh, large scale. And so we kind of asked, is there a correlation with the SRS domains, and, you know, pain domain specifically of the total SRS score? Because if there is, then maybe we're giving them the SRS 30 anyway. A lot of academic institutions give that as a part of routine research and care. And maybe we can find a trigger there so that we can sort of look for the, the correlations between the SRS 30 and the pain catastrophizing scale. So we don't have to give the pain catastrophizing scale to everybody. And so that's what we found is that if you have an SRS pain domain of 3.5 or worse, pretty good chance you're a pain catastrophizer. So I think what we're, we're trying to do now is say, let's give the kids the SRS 30 score a month or two or three before surgery. And if they score less than a 3.5 or less on the SRS pain domain, then let's also give them the pain catastrophizing scale and if they score above a threshold, now we know who we can send to our psychologists. Because there is some literature that says the psychologists can help these kids. And again, they taught us, you know, years ago, we, they'd rather do that before surgery than after. It's going to be a lot more effective, we hope. So that, that's okay. the gist, is that the SRS-30 can help you predict who might be a pain catastrophizer. That's perfect. And I, I think it really kind of led to my, through my next question too, of how you would implement it in practice or how you suggest that we do. And so, you know, having the SRS 30 in place, scoring 3.5 or, or worse on the pain score, and then getting them in to see uh, your psychologist beforehand. So that's wonderful. Now, it seems over the last 10 years that we've started to focus more on pain and mental health within scoliosis research. And like I said, I think it's because it's, we're kind of focusing more on the entire patient instead of just the orthopedic or scoliosis side. Do you think there's any other components that maybe we haven't considered as much or, or maybe delved into as much as we should, or maybe a good future focus? Uh, that's a good question. No, I think, 
you know, it is a fun time uh, to be doing this, you know, I mean, kind of looking back, I'm not a scoliosis historian by any means, but you know, the 50s and 60s were all about something totally and completely new, like the Harrington rod. And then the 80s and 90s, we saw this sort of explosion of new ways to instrument the spine, CD instrumentation, and then pedicle screws in the 90s and 2000s. And it is kind of fun. Now it seems like there is more influence, kind of getting back to the basic of what about the actual patient, right? And uh, how are they doing? And I think these new patient reported outcomes that we have, like the SROS 30, which is disease specific, and all the promise measures that are coming out, you know, the NIH that we have, it's kind of fun. We're, we're coming back a little bit full circle to treating the patient. You know, sometimes I tell the fellows and residents that we all became doctors before we became orthopedic surgeons. We went to medical school first. And so I don't, I don't know. I think that, you know, next steps are really kind of looking at those promise measures, looking at the patient reported outcomes, looking at diving into little facets of human beings, like how they perceive pain uh, and just trying to, you know, because I think we, you know, study groups and all of us continue to figure out how can we get better correction in the coronal plane, the sagittal plane, and the axial plane, and do we do pontes or not, that kind of stuff. But I think part of the fun of this is how does it influence the patient at the end of the day. And so I think that uh, pain is one aspect and function is another aspect. And so I think we've got these great tools now with these patient report outcomes. It's going to be fun to kind of look at our downstream effects of how we treat these kids over the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. I think breaking, and, and as you guys have done so well, breaking down those silos and trying to get our other subspecialty uh, colleagues involved is really the way that we can treat that whole patient your point's great i mean working with other disciplines you know like we we work we've got a great psychology department and maybe you know at your institution you have a great uh therapy department or sports medicine department to kind of look at return to function return to sports i think there's still so many fun aspects we can study in these scoliosis patients about how we affect their lives and uh, working with other disciplines is a great way to do it one final question for you, Brandon. The biggest challenge in producing research for me has just kind of been getting started and trying to build kind of the infrastructure around me. Uh, any advice for people like me that are either early into practice or trying to build some more infrastructure around them? Or what do you see as your biggest challenge in producing research related to scoliosis? Yeah, um, well, I think, I think the biggest limitation is always time, right? You, you may have 100 ideas uh, and you, you only have time for two or three sometimes or maybe one. Uh, and so I think, you know, the hard part is taking all those hundreds of ideas that you may have and trying to find the one or two that you really think are the most interesting to you. And because then if you're, if you're engaged, then it'll show through in, in what you study and how you go about it. Uh, so I think time is number one. And then I think everybody has a different set of resources in the environment that they practice in. And you have to kind of say, you know, what is my resource level? I, I, I may want to you know, study the axial plane of scoliosis, but if I don't have an EOS machine or, you know, an MRI machine available to look at the axial plane, that's not going to work here. You know, if I don't have, you know, 12 research coordinators to plow through a thousand charts retrospectively, but maybe you have a really good EMR liaison, and so you can start looking at how to interact with the EMR and the patients and get these, you know, patient-oriented outcomes questionnaires via the EMR, as an example. So I think it's just, what are my resources and then what am I truly interested in so I can put my time into it. It's great. I really appreciate it, Brandon. Thank you for um, joining us. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you so much to all of our guests today, and especially to my co-host, Dr. Avalon Genevois. It's been a real pleasure working with you and putting together this podcast. And it, we'd like to especially thank Dr. Yazici, Dr. Shaw, and Dr. Ramo for their time. Thank you so much, Ryan. It was a pleasure to uh, meet online all these great people. Uh, we, we were very pleased to have these uh, few minutes with you all. And we hope to see you again online for the next dialogues, um, continuing on highlights on uh, the 2020 uh, annual meeting of SRS. Goodbye. The Scoliosis Research Society is a nonprofit professional organization made up of physicians and allied health personnel. Their primary focus is on providing continuing medical education for healthcare professionals and on funding and supporting research in spinal deformities. Please visit SRS.org for further information. Scoliosis Dialogues, an SRS podcast, is supported in part by a grant from the Trump.